In this presentation, we talk about the terminology associated with bone. Uh, we're going to talk about different joints, their types, a uh, few joint conditions, and diseases that can arise. Now, um, you may have heard me say before that form follows function. Uh, the bones have a lot of surface features. They have sites for muscle attachment, tendons, ligaments, uh, openings that serve as passages for nerves and blood vessels. So, you know, understand that the structure of a bone, uh, the openings, all of these things exist for a reason. Now, there are several categories of bone markings. We have projections or processes, and these are things that grow from the surface of a bone. Now, often these do start with the letter T. For example, we could have a uh, trochanter or tubercle or tuberosity. We also have depressions and cavities and holes. Um, these are passageways for materials to go through, like blood vessels or nerves. Um, or they may just be places where a muscle lies and results in this little depression. In any case, these often start with the letter F. Uh, for example, fossa or foramen. Uh, those are a couple of terms. Now, in your textbook, there is a table that describes these markings. And you see tuberosity is a large rounded projection that may be roughened. We have crests, trochanters, lines, tubercles, epicondyle spine processes, all of these. And I'm not going to go through and talk about each of these. This is more or less a memorization exercise. You just have to go through, look at the titles, and understand the basic description of each of these structures. So, <coughs> we mentioned before that there are certain types of bone cells involved in the development and maturation of bone. So we have osteocytes, which are mature bone cells living in compact bone in the lacunae, which are located in the lamellae. We have osteoblasts, which are bone-forming cells. We have osteoclasts, which are bone-destroying cells. And remodeling and reshaping of bone is performed both by the osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Now, just a couple of questions then, things that you should be aware of from this section. What are the three cell types? And in general, bone markings fall into two categories. What are they? Within those categories, be able to name the different bony type or bony structures. Now, big thing we're going to talk about here are joints. Um, and another word for a joint is an articulation. Anything that moves is an articulation. Any place where we have two things stuck together is an articulation. So joints may have a couple of functions. First, they hold bones together. You know, I've got bones in my skull that are multiple bones that are held together. Uh, they are completely immobile. Um, other joints allow for a degree of mobility. And so we classify joints uh, a couple of ways. We base the names on function or structure. And actually the functional classification and the structural classification, those names do go kind of hand in hand. What we see are immovable joints, which are synarthroses. Um, example of those are the sutures in the skull. And most sutures uh, are synarthroses. We have amphiarthroses, which are slightly movable joints, such as those in the vertebrae. And then we have diarthroses, which are freely movable joints. While we say freely movable, that doesn't mean that they can go in any direction, but it means that within a range of uh, movement, they have a free kind of range. So arms, legs, fingers, toes. Now, fibrous joints then are generally immovable. Those are generally synarthroses. Cartilaginous joints are immovable or slightly movable. Those are the amphiarthroses. And synovial joints, which are freely movable, are the diarthroses. So you can see that we have this relationship between the types. All freely movable joints, all diarthroses, are synovial joints. Uh, that being one example. 
there is a table again in your textbook uh, table 53 which gives this summary of joint classes and you can take a look at that one of my favorite actually um, structural classification just because I'm a dentist this is a gomphosis which is the periodontal ligament and while it does say that it is immovable the fact is that the gomphosis the thing that holds your tooth in the socket this ligament does allow for a slight amount of movement uh, not very much but when we bite down on substances our teeth can give just a little bit we have stretch receptors located inside of that ligament so if we bite on something too hard the stretch receptor will trigger a reflex which will cause us to open our jaw very quickly uh, if it didn't have that little bit of stretch that wouldn't happen and we'd be, end up breaking teeth um, fibrous joints these are bones some examples of bones that are united by some fibrous joints uh, the sutures of the skull being a good example now they are fibrous up through our teenage years eventually those actually those bones fuse together um, but the fibers you know they allow uh, growth uh, of the brain the syndesmoses uh, allow more movement than say sutures uh, we have again connective tissue that allow a little movement of a joint uh, they talk about the distal end of the tibia and fibula what that does is that allows us to rotate our foot just a little bit now cartilaginous joints and bones connected by cartilage a uh, good example is the pubic symphysis this is fibrocartilage and um, it allows just a little bit of wiggle of the hips now prior to childbirth there's actually a hormone that is released called relaxin which softens the cartilage in the pubic symphysis it also softens some other connective tissues um, and allows the pelvis to stretch and move a little bit more uh, during childbirth we also have intervertebral joints uh, now we have all of these vertebrae and there's a slight amount of movement allowed at each one maybe just one or two degrees but the combination of movement over all of those vertebrae allow us to bend quite significantly along our uh, the curvature of the back so again some examples of cartilaginous joints we have fibrocartilage in the vertebrae we have fibrocartilage in the pubic symphysis and you can see we have some cartilage that attaches say the first rib to the sternum again allowing just a little bit of movement we actually have cartilage that attaches all of the ribs to the sternum and without that it would be very difficult for us to breathe the big one synovial joints and these are joints that are separated by a joint cavity we have two bones um, we have a joint cavity that surrounds the ends of those two bones and located between in, in that cavity is something called synovial fluid it is a liquid that acts as a lubricant the capsule encloses the cavity and reinforces the joint so that the two bones don't get separated easily and again they are freely movable within a range um, the bones in a synovial joint all have cartilage on the surfaces uh, and we have ligaments that will reinforce that joint spreading from one bone to the next now this shows some of the joints that we have you know, we have joints in the knee the shoulder the hand but you know, pretty much any movement that you can make is occurring around a synovial joint I mean any movement of your fingers your wrist your arm that's all the product of synovial joints there are some other structures associated with synovial joints to aid in movement um, there are little fibrous sacs full of fluid called bursa uh, 
they're not actually part of the joint, but they allow movement around the joint so that tissues don't rub against each other. They may act as a way for a tendon to slide over an area. Uh, they may act as a surface for a bone to rub or move so that it doesn't you know, irritate muscles above or uh, you know, poke through tissues in some way or other. Now, another structure is a tendon sheath, which is kind of like a bursa, except that it's a tube and it rolls. Uh, there used to be some balloon toy things when I was growing up that were basically tubes and you'd try to pick them up and they would just roll between your hand. Uh, and that's kind of like what a bursa does. Both prevent wear and tear on the tendons and protect underlying and overlying structures. Um, to me, I think of the bursa, since it is sort of this flattened fiber sack, as being like those coin pouches that you, as a kid, you used to get from the bank. Those little plastic things with the slot in them. Now, here's an example showing both a bursa and a tendon sheath. And you see the bursa existing here, kind of between the uh, humerus and the under part of the acromion of the scapula, so that we can rotate this without those structures coming into contact. And you see a tendon sheath here, where we have the tendon of the biceps muscle, and because it has to roll over the humerus, we've got this uh, tube that will allow free movement of that tendon. There are a variety of synovial joints, depending on the actions that they allow. So we have flat surfaces rubbing against each other, and those are plane joints. And examples of those are the carpals of the wrist. We have a hinge joint, which allows free movement in one plane only. Um, that's an example of the humerus, uh, where we, or the elbow. We have pivot joints, which allow us to twist a little bit. Now, this they're talking about being able to rotate the arm slightly, but another good example of a pivot, pivot joint is that joint between the axis and atlas that allow us to turn our head, and that pivot point being the dens of the uh, axis. We have condyloid joints, and a condyle, it allows movement in two different directions. It's sort of an oval-shaped uh, structure, that, like an egg, that is um, in an oval-shaped cup. And it allows ro movement both, uh, well, it allows movement in two pane planes. So not only can our hands grip but we can also spread our fingers apart uh, in the joints of the hand and this is a condyloid. It occurs at the first um, uh, phalange and the metacarpals of the hand. The saddle joint, this is a joint that gives us some unique abilities as we have a saddle joint in our thumb. Now, as a result, we can grip things a little differently than other uh, animals. This actually gives us the opposable thumb. So we can take the tip of our thumb and touch it to the tips of our fingers. This allows us to manipulate tools in a way that other animals can't. And many people have felt that this opposable thumb provided by this particular joint is one of the reasons that man, you know, is the kind of the superior species on the planet. We are able to use tools. The joint that allows the freest movement of all is the ball and socket joint. And it allows movement in all directions. The problem with the ball and socket joint is that it's also one of the less stable joints and it is easily or more easily dislocated. Now, we're going to talk about conditions uh, in our next presentation, but we're going to stop here. Uh, we will pick up on the different diseases and conditions of bone uh, again in a subsequent presentation. Thank you. hope this helps.